So let's, I, a good place to begin, actually, is not with the arguments themselves, but um, perhaps to think a little bit about the conversations happening today. And um, we often hear from scientists and from philosophers and from figures in pop culture, uh, we often hear uh, many reasons against the existence of God. Uh, perhaps in our own personal conversations, we hear this. Uh, so some of the stuff that I've come across uh, in things that I've read or heard on the news, um, I'll just share it on the slide. And we'll, we'll just, you know, mention a little bit of this. But first, there's this idea that the belief in the existence of God is simply a matter of blind faith, that, that there, there's no evidence for the existence of God. And there couldn't be because we're talking about God. I mean, how could there be evidence? Um, there's this idea that all religious belief should be on blind faith, i.e. you should just believe in it. It doesn't matter what the evidence is. Uh, so there's that idea. Uh, and if that is the case, then one could validly ask, why should anybody take the existence of God seriously if it is only a matter of blind faith, right? In other words, if there are no persuasive reasons for uh, belief in the existence of God, uh, then one should rightly be skeptical. There's also this idea that uh, the existence of God is not a scientific proposition. It cannot be scientifically proven. Uh, and many people think that if something cannot be scientifically proven, it is not a claim of knowledge and therefore one should not believe in it. There's a famous argument from evil where, uh, you know, people observe the, the natural evil and moral evil in the world, and they conclude that, you know, if God did exist, then this God is permitting evil to take place. And, and that seems to be uh, an improbable notion that if such an all powerful God existed, who could sort of intervene in the world, uh, that God would prevent a lot of this evil and suffering and disease that we see. Um, some have referred to latest findings in quantum physics. Some physicists like Lawrence Cross and others have talked about how uh, in quantum physics, things just appear out of nothing. Particles appear out of nothing. Some people have suggested the universe can appear out of nothing. Uh, therefore, there's, this idea of God is completely useless. Um, I think if we examine that a bit more, we'll find that that is a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, when a lot of physicists say the word nothing, they're not really talking about an absolute nothing. They're talking about the absence of certain conditions, uh, but not a total nothing. Uh, the co another common objection, uh, if everything has a cause, then who caused God? And worth, worth thinking about. Uh, Stephen Hawking, in his last book, uh, actually wrote, and I've quoted it on the screen, but I'll read it. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, and why we exist. He goes on to write that you don't need God um, to sort of get the ball rolling on the universe. So this is a very interesting statement. Um, he's basically saying that uh, gravity, the universe, via gravity uh, can create itself. Uh, this of course raises questions about how something can exist before it exists. So it's also worth thinking about. Some have suggested um, speculatively that our universe, the universe we inhabit, um, that it may actually be eternal. Eternal here meaning it may have an infinite past time. Uh, the Big Bang Theory is, of course, the, the most mainstream theory of the universe's origins. That would mean the universe has a finite past. But some have speculated that either there were Big Bangs before that, there's time before the Big Bang, and so on. But the general idea here, one objection, again, an objection to the existence of God, is if the universe has always existed in some form, then that's it. Uh, th there could be no creator because you always had a universe, so there's no need to posit a creator. Uh, another very creative objection that I've, I've come across is, uh, let's say you accept the Big Bang theory. That would mean the universe is some 13 billion years old, goes back to a singularity, what they call the Big Bang. Um, and that's when time began. 
so there's no uh, time before the Big Bang. And some have said that if that's the case, if there's no time uh, you know, before the Big Bang, then there's no way for God or a God to create the universe because there's no time. So the idea here is that if there's no time, there can be no activity. Uh, so that's, that's another argument I've seen. Now, a lot of these arguments, not all of them, but a lot of them assume uh, a approach to knowledge known as uh, ver uh, the principle of verification, uh, also known as logical positivism. This is an idea of knowledge, which basically says that knowledge of, of the truth or falsity of anything, right, we can know what is true and what is false primarily through empirical observation. Right? So this is the idea that something is not real, something is not true, unless it is based on or verified through empirical observation with the five senses. A lot of the objections to the existence of God rest on that idea, uh, especially with the first few here. So one thing we may ask about this principle of empiricism or the principle of empirical verification is if it's the case, right? If that is what knowledge is based on, uh, right? Empirical observation, it verifies all knowledge. How do you verify the actual principle of empirical observation? In other words, as one scholar, uh, Aziz Ismail has written in his book, he says regarding this idea that knowledge of true and false is through empirical observation. He says that it is important to note that the positivist valuation of science is itself not scientific. So he's saying firstly that this statement of verification here, it's not actually a scientific claim. It's not a scientific claim because the claim that things can be proven true or false through empirical observation, that claim itself cannot be proven through empirical observation. This author goes on to say that this is a philosophical and hence generally a cultural attitude. It is an attitude towards science, an image of science. This becomes clear if we consider a question which was often asked by the critics of this doctrine, right? the critics of this empiricist idea. How is the principle, the principle of verification to be verified? In other words, can you prove the claim true and false knowledge is known through empirical verification empirically. You can't because it, it, it is itself a not, not an empirical claim. He goes on to say that it is obvious that this principle cannot be verified. Judged by its own criterion, the principle of verification is clearly not a proposition of knowledge. So what this simply tells us at this point is uh, that Empirical observation by itself is not a sufficient methodology to attain knowledge. That's basically what it means. And the proof of that is the principle of empirical verification cannot be proven through empirical verification. That's one thing to know. We can expand on this thought. So pause, you could sort of pause this video for a second and, and think about the following two questions. First, what are uh, some beliefs that science takes for granted, right, as true, but which science itself does not prove? So that's one question. Uh, the second question would be, what are some beliefs that we do hold to be true, right, things we believe in everyday life, but which are not proven by science? So, you know, you, if you have the time, you could pause the video and you could just think about this for a couple of minutes. Uh, and, and maybe the answer is nothing, but it's, it's something worth thinking about. So here, I'll share sort of what I came up with. So the first question, like, what does science take for granted? So certain truths about reality that science assumes to be true, that, that are not proven by science. So here's what I came up with. Uh, the first is uh, that we exist individually. The fact that I exist um, 
I didn't run experiments to know that I exist. I'm simply conscious of that fact. I'm conscious from that I infer that I exist. Uh, Descartes pretty much, that's pretty much what he said. I think therefore I am. So I know my, I know about my own existence directly through my own self-consciousness. I didn't have to run scientific experiments for that. Uh, it's not even necessary for me to know that I exist. It's not necessary for me to physically observe a world around me. Um, Ibn Sina had this famous experiment called the flying man. He basically said that if you take somebody, you suspend them in midair, you, you, you know, there are, they, can't, they can't see anything, they can't feel anything, right? In, in modern terms, you could sort of inject some medicine, some anesthetic into somebody where, where they can't uh, feel anything, you know, paralyze their whole body, um, and so on. But that person, despite having no physical sensations, having no physical observations, that person would still be self-aware and conscious. And it just goes to show that uh, our notion that we exist uh, is not dependent on empirical observation. It's not dependent on science. Second, uh, the laws of logic. Uh, there are certain uh, logical propositions that all human thinking assumes when we think, when we interpret the world. Uh, Aristotle identified these as the laws of logic, and I've sort of list, lifted, listed them on the screen here. This is an image from, from Google Images. So simple laws like uh, A is A, uh, the law, which is law of identity, or the law of non-contradiction, right? Uh, something cannot exist and not exist at, at the same time. Uh, something cannot be true and false at the same time. Right, so these are laws of logic, and we, our minds, we know, we know these are true, uh, without any physical observation. We don't use science to know this. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The whole enterprise of science depends on these laws of logic. We do science and many other things through these laws of logic. We don't prove them through science. Uh, the belief that our senses and our sensory experience is yielding true knowledge of the world. Again, we just assume this to be true. We have no proof that our senses are reliable. Uh, we just take it for granted. Uh, and all of science depends on this assumption that our, the five senses uh, you know, our, our observation of the world gives us actual knowledge of the world. Uh, for all we know, we could be living in a simulation or a virtual reality or the matrix or something. There's no way we would know that from our five senses alone. Uh, the idea that uh, around that we inhabit a physical world. This, I would say, again, is not proven by science. Uh, it is an inference from our sensory experience, right? We, what we simply experience directly is not a whole physical world. We experience uh, what some philosophers called sensory impressions, images and sounds and this and that. And we've interpreted our sensory experience a certain way to conclude that there is a physical world around us that we inhabit. So this is an inference again, it is an interpretation. Uh, it is not self-evident that there is a physical world. Uh, furthermore, the physical world that we inhabit, uh, we, most of us anyway, most of us assume that the world, the physical world behaves in a rational orderly manner. So this is another assumption we make about the world. Science relies on this assumption. If we did not assume that there was a physical world, and if we did not assume the physical world behaves in a orderly, regular way, we just couldn't do science. The whole enterprise of science would, would, would be impossible if we didn't have this belief about the world. Again, it is a belief. It, it's not something that we prove through science. It's something that science itself depends on. Following from that, uh, the idea that the physical universe behaves according to certain laws and that these laws are not broken. Uh, you know, various laws of physics, for example, laws like gravity, thermodynamics, but I'm talking more generally. The very idea that there are laws that we can discover, 
that is an assumption about the world. It is an assumption that we use to actually undertake science. In a sense, you have to already, before you, you do scientific experiments, you have to have this general idea of what you're looking for. So this general idea was that the world behaves according to laws. And then, you know, science is very much about discovering what those laws are. The idea of cause and effect generally stated that some objects in the world or some events in the world directly bring about other objects or other events. So this is causation. Uh, again, scientific experiments would not make sense uh, without assuming that there is a principle of causation. Forget And, and beyond science, uh, our activity in the world would not make any sense. It would not be rational to act in the world to obtain certain results if we did not assume causation was a universal principle, right? Cause and effect. Uh, in, in the sciences, it is often assumed that what is true about a sample of physical items that we experiment on is also true for all physical items of that type or of the same kind. Uh, this is often known as the notion of induction. And this belief, uh, science, a lot of science rests upon the idea of induction, that, that conclusions about particular things can be universalized to at least all the members of that class of things in the world across time and space. Uh, the, finally, the belief that other minds exist. Um, you know, we look at, we interact with people every day. We assume we're dealing with other rational minds. We've never seen anybody's mind, um, but we have made, we've assumed, we've inferred rather, uh, that there are the, the person I'm talking to or the person I'm meeting, they also have a rational mind. Uh, we can't observe anybody's consciousness. We can't even, we know our own consciousness directly. We don't know anybody else's consciousness, but we're assuming that other people are conscious. So that, that is an inference, right? It's not a scientific observation that other people have their own individual consciousness. So again, these are things that science depends on, science takes for granted. I'm bringing this up because what we're going to find, see eventually is that some of these items on this list are also taken for granted uh, in these arguments for the existence of God. Uh, that, that, that's why this is important to know. Um, now, there are also, uh, you know, there are also a number of things that science can't tell us. That science that are outside the scope of science, things that are that are true but they're outside. Uh, the scope of science. So I think it's it's worth sort of talking about some of those things. Uh, so I'll show you an example. Uh, so this is a good video here, a video clip from um, the uh, Christian philosopher William Lane Craig. He's talking to a scientist named Peter Atkins and they're actually debating this very question. Is there anything uh, that science cannot know? So I'll just uh, play the clip for you. It's just a couple of minutes, but it's, it's certainly worth listening to. So here we go. Do you deny that science cannot hunt for everything? Yes, I do deny that science So what can't it account for? Well, I, had you brought that up in the debate, I had a number of examples that I was going to give. Uh, I think there are a good number of things that cannot be scientifically proven, but that we're all rational to accept. Let, so, me, list, let me list five. Logical and mathematical truths cannot be proven by science. Science presupposes logic and math, so that to try to prove them by science would be arguing in a circle. Uh, metaphysical truths, like there are other minds other than my own, or that the external world is real, or that the past was not created five minutes ago with an appearance of age, are rational beliefs that cannot be scientifically proven. Ethical beliefs about statements of value uh, are not accessible by the scientific method. You can't show by science whether the Nazi scientists in the camps did anything evil as opposed to the scientists in Western democracies. Aesthetic judgments, number four, cannot be accessed by the scientific method because the beautiful, like the good, cannot be scientifically proven. And finally, most remarkably, would be science itself. Science cannot be justified by the scientific method. Science is permeated with um, 
unprovable assumptions. For example, in the special theory of relativity, the whole theory hinges on the assumption that the speed of light is constant in a one-way direction between any two points A and B. But that strictly cannot be proven. We simply have to assume that in order to hold to the theory. But you're missing the whole... So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> So okay. we are, uh, none of these beliefs can be scientifically proven, and yet they are accepted by all of us, and we're rational in doing so. So, um, <clears throat> back to our regular programming. But anyway, that, that was an important, uh, an important set of remarks there in terms of what science cannot tell us. So to summarize what was said, um, the scientific empirical method you know, is unable to establish a number of things. Uh, and again, the rules of logic, which we've already talked about, mathematical truths. So those of you who take in cal advanced calculus and algebra and all these things or the basic stuff, you may all remember the Pythagorean theorem. So think about how the Pythagorean theorem is proven mathematically. Uh, we certainly do not go and start examining every right angled triangle that we find in the world and start adding up a squared plus b squared equals c squared. In other words, we don't prove the Pythagorean theorem by taking a sample of right angled triangles and testing, you know, the, 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 their, their, their dimensions. We don't do that. Uh, what we do is we prove it using purely uh, logical principles, logical operations of mathematics. So all mathematics uh, like this is outside the realm of science and science cannot say anything about that. Uh, the idea that science is the only way to know truth, uh, that idea is also uh, not scientifically proven. It has no scientific or empirical proof. Uh, and it's just like the idea that something is only real if perceived empirically, that claim, again, cannot be proven empirically. Uh, a number of other things that were mentioned, aesthetics, notions of beauty, uh, notions of ethics and values, uh, metaphysical truths, if there is such a thing, uh, consciousness, uh, anything that could lie beyond the physical realm. So these things are also outside the realm of science. And again, I'm bringing this up because it, discussions about the existence of God that are taking place today are often uh, hijacked by this claim that, uh, well, it's not, you know, God or, or, you know, the metaphysical cannot be scientifically proven, and therefore that's really it. Um, and I'm simply trying to say that a very honest assessment of knowledge in epistemology will certainly lead one to conclude, I think, that there are numerous uh, claims of knowledge that cannot be proven by science, and that's okay. Now, I'm not here to um, attack the very enterprise of science, uh, because science actually does some very, very important things for us. Uh, what does science actually do? Uh, I would say that science is in the business of describing or modeling the behavior of physical objects in the world, uh, the interactions of natural phenomena. Uh, I believe that is what the enterprise of science is about. It's, it's basically documenting all the laws of how things behave and for particular behaviors or particular interactions uh, that scientists observe, uh, science can tell us the conditions, the particular conditions that lead to certain behaviors, right? So particular variables and conditions that lead to certain interactions and reactions among natural things. I think that's what science is doing. It's very successful in what it's doing. Uh, because when you can describe and model and predict uh, how natural things are interacting, uh, you can also manipulate it uh, for positive ends, right? This is what technology ultimately is the fruit of. So I think that's very important. Uh, an analogy that's been used uh, to talk about sort of what 
the business of science is, is uh, take like you have a, a board game, a, ch a chess game or a checkers game, for example. Uh, so hypothetically, let's say that you are watching a game of chess and, and you actually, you don't know the rules of chess. You haven't read about it all. You just come across a chess game and you can simply watch the game happen. Uh, if you observe what's going on enough times, you could probably, by sheer observation and, and you know, making some inductive conclusions about what you observe, you could probably derive all the rules of chess by observing it. You know, observe as, you know, 50 chess games or something. You could derive, derive all the rules. That is sort of what science is like in terms of uh, observing the interactions in the universe, discovering the patterns, describing them, modeling them. That's what the laws of nature are. So one philosopher named Edward Fazer, uh, he tells us uh, in an article that he wrote uh, that what science uncovers are in effect the rules that govern the game. That, that is the natural world. Uh, its domain of study is what is internal to the natural order of things. It presupposes that there is such an order, such as the rules of checkers presuppose that there are such things as checkerboard game pieces. Thus, science cannot answer the question why there is any world at all or any laws at all. So let's pause there. So again, uh, if we're watching a game of checkers or chess, uh, science is like observing the game and deriving the rules from observation. Now, we could do that, right? You could derive all the rules of chess or checkers. Uh, and, and, and you could actually not only derive the rules, you could master the whole game just by observation, right? And by science, quote unquote. Uh, but that would not tell you where the pieces came from. It would not tell you where the game board came from. It wouldn't tell you why the players are, who are those who are playing the game. It doesn't tell you why they're playing the game. Similarly, uh, you could um, learn to play a video game. You could become the best at a video game. Uh, master all the, the moves and the rules. Uh, that's sort of like science. Uh, but no matter how good you are at a video game, it doesn't give you any insight into uh, how the game was created, right? You can be the best at like Grand Theft Auto, right? You can beat the game a zillion times, whatever it is. It doesn't tell you, uh, that doesn't get you into the internal code of the video game. So this question, if you're following this analogy, where does the game board come from? Uh, what are the pieces made out of? Why are there, why is there a game? Why, why are there pieces? These are questions that are beyond science. So similarly, um, why, there is a, uh, why there is a universe at all, why there is a physical world at all, uh, those are beyond science. And as Edward Fazer says, um, to look into the question of why are there any laws of nature at all, any laws, why is there existence at all? Uh, as he said, you need to look to philosophical argument, which goes deeper than anything mere physics can uncover. So this question of is there God or a God, or a, is there a transcendent reality? Is there a metaphysical reality? Uh, from which you know this world this physical reality has come from those questions are not scientific questions they are metaphysical questions and one needs a different methodology to look at those questions that uh, and that methodology would be a philosophical methodology so now we're, we're not talking about science per se, right? There's a question of the existence of God is not a scientific question. Uh, it is a question of worldviews, so therefore it is a philosophical question. Uh, that doesn't mean empirical observation is irrelevant to this question, uh, but it is, it is not a strictly empirical question. And there's different types of philosophical reasoning or arguments that one would use to assess a worldview. Because now the idea, now we're talking about worldviews. The idea that God exists and God created the world, that's a worldview. The idea that there is no God and the world is simply on its own, there's only physical reality, that's another worldview. We would assess the worldview by uh, philosophical reasoning. Now there's 
you may be aware there's different types of arguments, deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning. What we see in modern science, is a lot of it is inductive reasoning. So um, inductive reasoning, which again, this is the dominant sort of form of argumentation in, in scientific work. Uh, it's based on the observation of you observe specific cases of something, and then you try to generalize a conclusion from your observations. Uh, it is an inference. Uh, the conclusions of inductive reasoning are probably true. They're probabilistic. They're not certain. And um, here's another sort of example. So this notion of inductive logic. Uh, again, we're making inferences. So a lot of scientific work is inductive logic or inductive reasoning. Another type of reasoning is deductive reasoning. In deductive reasoning, you, your starting point is, is facts, things that you know to be true, or some very general principles that are known to be true. And in deductive reasoning, you apply logic. You apply some logical operations, logical deduction to your starting facts. And that, uh, those logical operations that you apply to the starting facts, so you're starting with something that's true, uh, you do some deductions, so you go from your premises to your conclusions. And if you did this correctly, uh, your conclusions are not just probabilistically true, they are true with certainty. So again, in, deduct in deductive logic, in deductive arguments, you start with a beginning premise, and then you have, a, you can say a middle premise, and then you have a conclusion. And the conclusion, follows with certainty from the premises. The type of arguments that are used to establish the existence of God are not inductive arguments, but they are deductive arguments. Whereas the type of arguments and reasoning used to establish most scientific claims, most of them, not all, are mainly inductive arguments. Now, we'll, we'll get into the details, but I have to set this up the proper way, that this discussion of worldviews, right, when we're debating or discussing about a particular worldview, like atheism or theism, uh, deductive logic and deductive arguments are going to be more valuable and relevant, not inductive arguments. So let's talk about worldviews. Uh, one worldview, that uh, is associated with atheism is called naturalism. So naturalism, this is one type of atheism, probably the more, more prominent type of atheism that you have today is naturalism. This is the belief that only physical things exist, or in other words, um, all existence is entirely physical or material. Again, it means only physical reality exists. And all things, knowledge, experience, emotions, even what people believe to be spiritual experiences, all of that is reducible to matter or material things. Uh, it would mean that all, um, all, all mental phenomena are actually caused and reducible to physical things. So that's naturalism, right? It's this belief that the physical cosmos is all there is. Uh, now, in science, uh, there is this notion of methodological naturalism. So when people are undertaking science, this worldview is assumed, right? When people are doing experiments and they're trying to find the cause of something, they're not going to start looking for non-physical causes. There's an assumption that the causes of any natural phenomena are, you know, a particular reaction or occurrence. There's an assumption that it only has physical causes. So that's called methodological naturalism. And what that's done, I think successfully, is it's shown that as far as the natural world is concerned, there probably are not any gods. There are probably no supernatural entities you know, intervening within nature. Uh, and you know, ancient peoples, it's well known, ancient peoples used to believe that Many everyday occurrences like, uh, uh, like tornadoes and floods and, and good crop seasons and bad crop seasons, that 
that these were caused uh, by supernatural forces, by gods and, and you know, things like that. And, and the, you know, science has come and shown uh, that this is not the case. There are now, there are physical explanations for most of, you know, that what, most of what goes on within nature. So that's methodological naturalism, but there's also naturalism as a worldview. So the worldview, the idea that physical reality is all there is, that's naturalism as a worldview. Um, I would propose to you that that is actually unprovable, right? So there's actually no evidence, there's no argument, inductive or deductive, to establish the claim that only physical things exist. This is what David Bentley Hart wrote, and I believe it is in your reading for the week. Uh, I'm going to uh, I'll quote this. So he says that the only fully consistent alternative to belief in God properly understood is some version of materialism or physicalism, or to use the most widely preferred at present, naturalism. Naturalism, he says, the doctrine that there is nothing apart from the physical order and certainly nothing supernatural, is an incorrigibly incoherent concept and one that is ultimately indistinguishable from pure magical thinking. Now, that is quite a bold claim that David Bentley Hart is making, but let's sort of hear him out. Why would he say that naturalism is an incorrigibly incoherent concept and almost like magic? Well, he says that the very notion of nature as a closed system entirely sufficient to itself is plainly one that cannot be verified deductively or empirically from within the system of nature. In other words, he's saying that even if, if, not, even if this were true, right, if, if physical reality is all that exists, right, and there's nothing beyond that, we who exist within physical reality, there's no way we could know this to be true. There's no way we could prove that physical reality that we inhabit is all there is. That's what he means. There's no argument that we have to make this, this claim. He goes on to say that naturalism is a metaphysical, that is to say it is an extra natural conclusion regarding the whole of reality, which neither reason nor experience legitimately warrants. So he's going, he's actually saying that naturalism as a theory, naturalism is a theory about all of reality. It's actually not just a theory about the natural world, like most scientific theories that we have, they concern uh, what is internal to nature. But naturalism is a theory uh, about all of reality. It's not just about nature, it's all of reality. So he's saying that naturalism is a metaphysical or extra natural conclusion regarding the whole of reality. He goes on to say naturalism can never be anything more than a guiding prejudice. So in other words, naturalism as a worldview does not actually have any logical basis behind it. It doesn't have any empirical basis behind it. Uh, it is actually, you know, to put it bluntly, naturalism as a worldview seems to be a form of blind faith. Uh, he refers to it as a prejudice. It seems to just be a bias uh, because there are no arguments for it uh, by its own theory, it could not, it could never be verified. So now there are other forms of atheism that are not exactly the same as naturalism, like one could talk about uh, platonic atheism, and that's sort of outside the scope, but I'm just talking here about naturalism. So if we're to assess naturalism as a worldview, I think we would run into a lot of problems. First being that we just simply can't argue, we can't make an argument for it. 